4.3 billion people live across this vast continent called Asia, and we are telling their stories. On this edition, Protectors of Peace, an inside look at the people who put their lives on the line to keep the Afghan capital safe at all costs. Coming to the rescue, meet the volunteers who take extraordinary risks to save homes and lives. And dreaming big, we meet a girl who's letting nothing stop her from the hope of one day becoming a world champion. I'm Sean Calebs, and this is Assignment Asia. Imagine knowing that every morning you leave for work, it could be your last. That's the risk soldiers in Afghanistan take every day in order to protect their country. In the capital of Kabul, the army is now in charge of all security, but it can come at a very high price. The Taliban is still very much active around Afghanistan, and Kabul is no exception. We wanted to get an inside view of what life is like for the nation's guardians, so I traveled to the Afghan capital where I met the brave people whose job it is to always prepare for the worst. It's just after 9 a.m. at the Kabul Military Training Center. But for these new members of the Afghan National Army, the day started hours ago. It's cold, wet, and muddy. But these young men know not to complain. It's the quickest way they'll get sent home. For men like Javad Ghazni, the Army offers many things, a paycheck, and a chance to break out of the poverty that plagues Afghanistan. Amid the rain and the fog of confusion, Major Ghulam Farooq is never far from his recruits. No detail is too small as he checks the new soldiers with their rifles knowing that one day, how well they prepare here at target practice could mean the difference between life and death. These recruits have been in the Afghan National Army for four weeks. They still have eight more weeks of basic training. They're paid about $150 a month. Once they finish basic, then they will choose their discipline, whether it be engineering, medical, infantry. Three months after that, these are the young men who are going to be on the front lines, providing security throughout Afghanistan. There is no question it's a difficult job. Until now, international troops led by the United States had been protecting Afghans from the Taliban and other insurgents. Now it will be up to these fresh-faced recruits and an Afghan army that has grown to more than 350,000. It's just after 12 noon. A suicide bomb shatters the delicate peace in one of the roughest areas of Kabul. A Humvee blocks the road, keeping curious onlookers at a distance. Troops control the perimeter as gunfire and rocket-propelled grenades are fired back and forth. Insurgents are targeting a guest house in the heart of the city. The Taliban says it launched the attack, alleging it is run by a Christian-based humanitarian group. The fight doesn't last long, and all the insurgents are killed. Recruits like Javed know the risk involved in protecting the Afghan people from scenes like this and he is ready to go to any length to make the nation safe. Security is one of the cornerstones of President Ashraf Ghani's platform, bringing stability and a more professional military to Afghanistan. He knows the country remains violent, and many more troops and leading politicians could pay the ultimate price in an effort to bring lasting peace here. To build a nation, you need to be willing to endure sacrifice. And without that, you're not a nation. One life, if that can transform this nation in terms of sacrifice, is worth sacrifice. 
And we are people who took on the Red Army without a hope. Now we feel that we can take on the greatest task on earth, which is to build a unified nation, a strong state, a vibrant economy, and a civil society that is free, that fits our nature. We have never been slaves. Throughout history, no one has conquered us. Back at the Kabul Military Training Center, Major Farooq is teaching these young men the skills they need to fight on the battlefield and survive, building endurance by running, learning and respecting the chain of command, and more than anything, simply by training over and over, like spending time on the gun range. So once troops find themselves in the thick of battle, the training will take over. To fully succeed, these recruits must overcome centuries of mistrust and ethnic fighting from within Afghanistan. Long simmering ethnic tension boiled over in 1989 when troops from the former Soviet Union left the country. Civil war erupted during the vacuum in leadership. Fighting was largely along ethnic lines among Pashtuns, Tajiks, Uzbeks and Hazaras. Pashtuns making up more than 40 percent of the country and the overwhelming majority of Taliban are Pashtun tribesmen who brought their version of Islamic fundamentalist rule to the country. Even though the Taliban were driven from power in 2001, bitterness, tension and fighting lingered. But army leaders work hard to root that strife out of the armed forces. Just by looking at their faces, one can see they represent all Afghanistan's 34 provinces, telling the story of a rich mosaic of people that settled this rugged land over the generations. Hazara, Tajiks, Uzbek, Pashtun. General Amanullah Patiani is in charge of the Kabul Military Training Center. That includes 13,000 staff and soldiers in training. He refuses to allow this ethnic thread to unravel. Friends who must come together to fight a common enemy. It's mid-afternoon along the busy Jalalabad Highway, the major road from Kabul leading east. A handful of Taliban troops dressed as soldiers launch an attack on the Elections Commission office. Sadly, this is a familiar drill for Afghans. Violence is a part of everyday life. The recruits know that it's not a question of if they will be put in harm's way, but rather when. But they are only one-third through their 12 weeks of boot camp, of shooting, marching, and having orders barked at them night and day. These recruits are preparing to fan out across the nation and be the first line of defense for Afghan citizens. 
As they wind up another long day of training, Major Farouk is back home, showing a side his soldiers will never see. Over tea, he tells me about the victories, like keeping Afghanistan peaceful during the 2014 elections, which guaranteed the country's first peaceful democratic handover of power. Farouk has three sons and a daughter with Down syndrome, who has a special place in her father's heart. He says he will stay on the front lines so his children can hopefully have a better life. Late in the afternoon, it's time for shopping ahead of dinner. While relaxing in the market, He's always aware that insurgents continue to plot their next move against the Afghan army. But he's certain he's prepared to win the fight. As of 2015, more than 12,000 international troops are still in Afghanistan, training the army to take over all security there. And while the U.S. is cutting the number of troops it provides to Afghanistan in half by the end of the year, top United States generals say Depending on the security situation there, that could always change. Still to come on Assignment Asia, coming to the rescue, meet the people who take great risk to fight fires voluntarily in China. Our stories this week focus on pressure, and nobody faces more immediate pressure than someone at war. But war is not always about fighting people. Li Yang traveled to the eastern Chinese city of Hangzhou, where she met one group who fights fires, sometimes at great risk. This is literally a race against time. Every second that passes is precious. So when the bell rings, it's instinct for these firemen to spring into action. But this is only a drill. Every simulation, though, is treated as if it's real. In the last decade, this brigade has responded to more than 2,900 emergencies and saved nearly 600 lives. But this isn't their full-time job. They are volunteers who actually work here at this clothing factory on the outskirts of Hangzhou city. Like other ordinary migrant workers in Hangzhou, they earn about $600 a month. But for them, it's the pay for two jobs. There's got to be someone firefighting, even if it's not me. Now that I'm much more experienced than others, I'd rather it's me doing the job. Wang Yafei joined the brigade eight years ago. After starting work as a dispatcher at the factory, he's now the deputy commander of Jingli Pu Fire Brigade. But the memories of his first mission are still fresh. When I first went out of the rescue, I saw a dead man stuck in a machine, half of his body broken into pieces. I forced myself getting in and retreated all parts of his body. I got so frightened at the moment. His heart was still beating. Wang and his team have met all sorts of emergencies, from traffic accidents, fires and drownings, to broken street lamps and people who've lost their keys. But whatever the circumstance, they've been conditioned to be out the door within 105 seconds of the alarm sounding. In a fire, survival or death can come down to just a few seconds. So it's really important for crews to get to the scene as quickly as possible. This volunteer fire brigade has been able to have the time it takes for the regular fire department to respond to emergencies in this district. And it's all because of one man. 
Li Lixin is the owner of the Jinglipu clothing factory. I started this volunteer brigade on April 19, 2003. It was one of my childhood dreams to own a fire truck ever since I saw my neighbor's house burn down. Also, I was born a meddler. When I see two people fighting in public, I can't help but rush forward and try to stop them. When the district government offered Li a chance to start a fire brigade and promised to pay for half the cost of a fire truck, Li jumped at the opportunity. A friend of mine once asked me, Li Xing, why do you choose to live such a hard life, spending tens of thousands to maintain this team and having to stay up late every night? I responded to him in this way, when you guys are playing mahjong, you get easily excited. And that's the same excitement I feel when I'm firefighting. Through the years, the Jinglipu Fire Brigade has gained the community's respect. But in the beginning, many residents mistook their intentions. We were volunteer firefighters. The people judged us. They said we charge for firefighting. This really upsets us. What we do is good, but in their mind, we did this purely for money. We were once blamed and hit because we arrived late. My members fought back against this accusation. But it turned out the folks felt we were obliged to be there on time because they thought we were from the official department. We were wearing the same uniform as they did. In 2012, the government released new guidelines requiring all volunteer fire brigades to meet a common standard, like having a garage of over 50 square meters, more than one fire truck, and at least eight firefighters. But the Jinglipu Fire Brigade had already met, even surpassed this standard from the beginning. In the past decade, Li has invested more than 10 million yuan or 1.6 million dollars in equipment for his brigade. And although firefighting training and tests are not mandatory, Li still chooses to have his crews practice as much as possible. What started as a personal interest has become a much bigger pursuit, which has a profound impact on his family too. He usually won't be home until 10.30 at night. Even if he's home, he may leave as soon as he gets an emergency phone call. He brings his intercom into her bedroom. It's with him for 24 hours a day. If I take his intercom outside for charging or turn it down, he might wake up, retrieve it. Every time we go out firefighting, day or night, my boss must be on the scene to direct the operations as long as he knows. If we do that by ourselves without telling him, he'll be angry with us. Li Lixing admits he's quick-tempered. He'll be angry if his men don't follow orders. But he says it's for their own safety. Safety, though, can't always be guaranteed. On New Year's Day 2013, there was a great fire in Chaoshan district. I remember it for the rest of my life. I lost three friends from the official fire department in it was factory full of flammable materials. We never retreated from a fire before, but this time we had to. It was too big. After we were off-site, I found we were missing one guy. I collapsed. I couldn't move at all. I thought we lost a member too, but luckily he had climbed over a fence. He was alive. My parents came all the way to Xiaoshan and asked me to get another job because I got injured, but I refused. There has got to be someone doing this. Fire is relentless. It takes people's lives, no matter if you're good or evil. The Jinglipu Fire Brigade has been facing danger head-on for more than 10 years. But new challenges seem to be blurring its prospect, especially when China's economy is slowing down and factories' profits keep dropping. My health is getting bad in recent years. I have diabetes and high blood pressure. Also, my business can't always make money. 
If one day my health status doesn't allow me to hold this team together anymore, I hope that other bosses can take it over and look after my crews. Lee won't be able to run the volunteer fire brigade forever, but it's a service and a legacy he hopes will live on long after he's fought his last fire. For Sign in Asia, I'm Li Yang in Hangzhou, Zhejiang Province, China. The number of volunteer firefighters in China has grown quite a bit since 2008. Today, there are nearly a quarter of a million volunteer fire services and more than two million registered volunteers in China. Now stay with us. Right after the break, China and ping pong go hand in hand, and some are willing to go to any length to make it to the top. Whether it's with tennis, basketball, or ping pong, young Chinese athletes are well known for their discipline and their willingness to do whatever it takes to get to the top. And the earlier they get started, the better their chances of achieving their goal. Fei Ya met one young girl in Beijing who is letting nothing get in the way of her ping pong dream. For 90-year-old Zhou Siyu, ping pong is much more than a pastime. It's a passion. She practices every afternoon. And it's been this way for a year and a half. Zhou now seems to move like a pro. Her mother says ping pong is what she was born to do. She always wants to keep playing after the train sessions. She's even refused to go home because she's that into it. D10 Sports School is filled with students just like Joe. She's actually considered a late bloomer in the sport. Most kids here start training when they're four or five, but Joe didn't begin until she was eight. At first she was learning to play the violin, but she said it was boring. At the time, I occasionally played ping pong with the neighbors, and she was totally intrigued. So I asked her cousin where she could play ping pong, and she knew one coach here. So then she started training. It's a rigorous regime, but Joe's mother says she needs it, if she's going to become China's next ping pong superstar. Zhongguo Tuan was the first. He won the world singles title back in 1959, becoming China's first world champion in any sport. And ever since, many young Chinese have shared a common dream to follow in his footsteps. Over the years, ping pong tables began popping up everywhere all over China, in parks, apartment common areas, and schoolyards. It's a favorite way of many students, workers and retirees to spend their spare time competing against each other on the tables. And contests for all sorts of levels are held across the country. Zhang Xiaoguang has been coaching children to play ping pong for more than 30 years. Parents want their children to learn how to play ping pong to help improve their agility, speed and coordination. They also want their kids to exercise to stay healthy. For us, it's a chance to identify the kids who have the potential to become future talents for China. Many of Zhang's students have gone on to join China's national team. He says Zhou Siyu has potential. Zhou Siyu has a good sense of where the ball will land. Her movements are coordinated, and her speed of attack is fast. But it will take even more practice for Zhou to make it to the next level. Zhou, though, isn't intimidated. She says she wants to play even more. She has the basic skills now, but she has to play in real matches. It's important in her training going forward. Going forward means coming to a place like this, where practice becomes even more intense. 
China has thousands of athletic academies that provide both intensive sports training and academic education for children. But an elite sports school like this one in Shanghai chooses their students selectively through rigorous auditions. The students train almost year-round, five hours a day, six times a week. Seven-time world ping-pong singles champion Cao Yanhua established this school, which bears her name in 1992. Having won 56 major titles at home and abroad, she knows how to rise to the occasion. Graduates from her academy have also become international sensations like Xu Xing, currently ranked one of the best in the world. Every year, nearly 200 students apply to be admitted to the school, but only 50 get in. The students in our schools have to work harder than others, from primary school to middle school to high school. They spend their childhood and adolescence here practicing and studying. I'm a mother. I know how difficult it can be for a child. But in our school, the students keep practicing no matter what difficulties they encounter. 14 years old Xu Wanghan was one of the few students talented enough to make the cut. We have to train from 3 until 8.30 every day. I also have lots of homework. But seeing if and how students can handle the pressure helps how identify the ones who have the best shot at becoming future stars. Many players often succumb to the pressure of competition. Not everyone can be the world champion. I care most about the future of the students who can't win the top prizes. And to be honest, most of them can't. But I hope students in our school can take the values that we teach them through ping pong and when they grow up, they can use what they've learned in their everyday lives. Values such as self-discipline, dedication and giving 100 percent at all they do. I might be disappointed if I can't reach my goal, but it's fine for me because I know I had fought hard for it. When I feel down, I come here and look at the medals that I've already won, and that encourages me. But when I'm doing well, I look at these, but they're from my past. For now, Xu Wanghan is looking ahead and training hard for a spot on China's national team. And Zhou Siyu's passion continues to grow a bold ambition to become the pride of her country. But in order to be that, she'll have to earn it, one ping-pong point at a time. For Assignment Asia, I'm Fei Ye. That's all the time we have for this week. You can watch this and all our other episodes on our website, www.assignment-asia.com. You can also share your thoughts and contribute story ideas for future shows by connecting with us online. I'm Sean Calebs. Thanks so much for watching, and join us again on Assignment Asia.